Greetings, everyone. Steve Cole here, and I'd like to welcome you back to another portion of our refresher lecture series. And this is um, the topic of this is going to be spinal motion restriction. And I jokingly call it spinal motion restriction in the 21st century. But I think you'll find that a lot of the uh, literature and a lot of the support for this goes back uh, well into the 1990s and sometimes even earlier. So I hope you enjoy this. Uh, for some of you, this will be old hat. Your agency is already doing this. And for others, you may find that your agency is lagging behind. And there may be a couple who are actually pushing the bounds of early adoption and are doing some of the neat and novel things we're going to discuss at the end of this. So we're going to try to stay on track and we're going to try to roll through this pretty quickly. But as always, we like to add a little bit of levity to our lectures. So this is me. You may have heard me and uh, seen my background in some of the other lectures. So instead of repeating that, I'm just going to ask you, what do you think my rapper name should be? Should it be CMXI, which are the Roman numerals for 911? Should it be Metalhead Medic? How about MC Nerd or the E4 Mafia? I'll let you pause and contemplate it and we'll come back when you press play again. Okay, if you're wondering what the answer should be, honestly, any and all of them can apply. Uh, I've been doing this for almost 30 years, so some people say I wrote my charts and drug doses and Roman numerals. Um, I am a metalhead. I'm also a nerd, a huge nerd, both for everything EMS and medical and many things that are not. Just get me started on Firefly. And as uh, E4, part of the E4 Mafia in the Army as a combat medic with the 101st Airborne Division. So all four of these apply. If you picked any of them, you win. And like many things in life, the only way you lose is if you do not show up and participate. Okay, let's roll along with this. So we like to, um, for accreditation purposes, we have to have learning outcomes and objectives properly constructed. But... You know, um, we like to also convert those into questions that the everyday person can say, yeah, yeah, I get that. That matters to me. So by the time we're done with this, you're going to understand what's wrong with the old way we used to board and collar everybody. And even the way we're, many agencies are doing it now, uh, we're going to describe the reasons, the cl adverse clinical consequences of that. We're going to discuss what we think that you should be doing. Now, again, it's your practice, your agency, and most importantly, your protocols and your doctor that has to approve this, but uh, there's quite a bit of literature to support this, what you, we think you should be doing, uh, who you should be doing it to, uh, who sh you should actually be using selective spinal mobilization, and are there any innovative solutions uh, out and about that may make this easier um, to implement. So some quick terms, of course, the cervical collar or C-collar, uh, I realize that we're teaching this all across this great nation and probably uh, some parts unknown. So if you haven't, if you aren't sure what we're talking about, it's a C collar. Other places call it an extrication collar. And we're really both in both cases, we're referring to a rigid cervical collar, like the type that's applied in the pre-hospital setting. I realize that some rigid collars like the Aspen collar are only applied in the um, in hospital setting in most jurisdictions. Um, so give us a little leeway on that. When we talk about SMR, we're talking about spinal motion restriction or spinal mobilization has also been called in the past. Uh, SSMR is selective, selective spinal motion restriction. Basically, uh, protocols, evidence-based, medical director approved protocols that give you the authority to apply screening and triage criteria to these patients. Something more than just the mark one eyeball. A specific evidence-based criteria that say this person needs a C-collar this person doesn't type of situation. So the question I get asked, and believe it or not, there are still some of these um, uh, late adopters out there, is why don't we just board everyone? Isn't there a substantial risk to not boarding everyone? Because, oh my God, they might have paralysis. They might have an unrecognized spinal cord injury. So let's talk about what those risks are. Um, there are three main types of risk, and we could parse these out and split these down or add a few more in here, but the big ones we're going to talk about are pain and pressure sores. Uh, we're also going to talk about the effect of C-collars on increased intracranial pressure, which is a big deal if they have a head injury uh, or have some complicating medical history. I'll throw that in there. 
And honestly, we worry about increasing the risk of injury by not boarding them or not collaring them, but applying the cervical collar even when applied correctly. Matter of fact, some would say especially when applied quote unquote correctly actually increases the risk of spinal injury through distraction and movement of the vertebra. And finally, it just doesn't do much good. There is really no evidence that cervical collars protect people from injury, other than the fact we've been doing it for 30 years. Uh, and if you look at the original study that was done in the next, uh, the Nexus study, they looked at, I had, I had, I'm pulling this out of my hind end, but I'd have to say almost 20,000, 23,000 victims of uh, spinal cord injury, uh, both with and without collars, and uh, they found no difference, no difference, no evidence of benefit whatsoever. This was a very well done, extensive study. So, let's t and some people, so let's break these down. So people say, well, pressure sores, they take hours and days. Well, yes and no. There's been quite a few studies, and these are just three or four of them. They've been around a while, but there's more. There are more um, that can occur as quickly as 30 minutes in the elderly, but as little as two hours in general population. We know that um, now many agencies or many hospitals have made a concerted effort to get people off the board much quicker, but still this happens. And especially the ones I'm really concerned about are the ones we should be worried about the most, the elderly and infirm. Um, 30 minutes, you say, well, my transport time isn't 30 minutes. I don't have to worry about that. Well, did you count your contact time? And your patient contact time begins uh, when you make contact and when you put them on the board. So if you spend seven, eight minutes on scene with them, and that's being uh, very optimistic, boarding them, calling them, put them in the rig, uh, touching base with you know non-emergent non type situations, easily that's 10 minutes on scene, if not more. Another 10 minute transport, you're already at 20 minutes. And you get them out of the rig, you take them in, you give report, they're already at 30 minutes easily. So, and so, and that's assuming they get off the board fairly quickly in the hospital, which sometimes happens and sometimes may not. So pressure sores are a big deal. And uh, essentially what pressure sores are, hard and mobile, uh, the body resting its hard and immobile uh, surfaces that pushes blood supply away from key uh, hard points of the, of the human anatomy and that of course causes tissue necrosis and degradation very quickly so it's a big deal it really is look it up let's talk about the actual risk of putting on the cervical collar and this was a, a very good study done in 2012 talking about the motion of unstable cervical spine during application removal of cervical mobilization collars now some people may say but wait a minute that's not me I put on C collars perfectly. These were this was done by physicians and well-trained individuals with, and they were doing this with fluoroscopy, and they were doing it in a stable, non-moving, non-chaotic environment. This was done with cadavers, and they still found between 3.6 and 4.4 millimeter average displacement of the cervical spine. Now here's the really worrisome part. So if you're tuning out, tune in for this. The motion was worse with injured cadavers. So what they did is they took uninjured cadavers, they studied the application, so on and so forth, and then they went in and then they did deliberate se uh, surgical severing of uh, the ligaments and tendons that support our spine and help give structure to it. And, you know, just as if there was a ligamentous tear uh, from a motor vehicle accident, whiplash, something like that, and they found the motion was actually worse. So, if the patient isn't injured, we're still moving them uh, despite our best efforts. Uh, and if they aren't injured, they really don't need it. But if they are injured, if they are injured, those at greatest risk have the greatest risk from application of seat collars. So when you understand that, the more injured they are, the greater risk app applying a cervical collar is to the patient. Here's another one that I found really interesting. There's been several studies. I just put, plopped two of them up there. Is that rigid cervical collars raise intracranial pressure by 5 to 10 millimeters of mercury. If you're wondering what normal intracranial pressure is, it's between 0 and 15. Uh, it's pre-typical. Now, most people hover around 5 or 10. 
so easily, this can put you into the mild increased intracranial pressure. Think, okay, it's mild, big deal. Well, if they actually have uh, any type of lesion, uh, certain anatomical abnormalities in their brain or actual head trauma, uh, even with mild um, in increased in cranial pressure, you can have her herniation start. So uh, certainly moderate. Uh, so if they have mild increased intracranial pressure and you push them over into moderate section, that causes that requires treatment and, of course, severe is life-threatening. Uh, so basically, if you have a patient with a moderate or severe head injury, they have increased endocrine pressure, they have uh, any type of endocranial swelling, the cervical collar doesn't help. It does not benefit at all, and it does not help. It can actually make them worse. So, and this was pretty consistent. Now, how does this happen? Well, the thought process is that, um, in essence, the... Uh, cervical collar compresses the jugular veins. If you think about how tight you should be pre uh, properly applying a rigid cervical collar, it compresses the jugular veins. And there's been several studies on this showing it decreased um, or increased engorgement or diameter above the cervical collar and decreased flow below it. Basically, it causes a backflow of blood into the brain. So more blood flow going in than out. And this causes swelling. And that's where the uh, increased intracranial pressure comes from. So in essence, the tight C collars, um, when we really crank them down, or not even crank it down, when we apply them correctly to where they're supporting underneath the jaw and they really have minimal movement, decreases outflow from the brain and increases intracranial pressure. And finally, I want to mention this one. This one really kind of scares me a bit. We always worry about that 0.1%, the internal decapitation, so on and so forth. And what the, what, or other types of displacement, what it was found that application of properly sized cervical collars, properly sized, properly applied cervical collars actually causes separation or increasing the distance between uh, the vertebral bodies. And this uh, with certain injuries, especially the so-called internal decapitation, it actually can be fatal. Uh, so keep that in mind that in the worst of the worst, a properly applied seat collar can actually increase the damage. So the sicker the patient is, whether it's head injury, whether it's ligamentous tears, whether it's vertebral separation, the more damage a seat collar can do. So the question is, what should you be doing? Well, some patients still require a spinal motion restriction. Um, and we're going to talk about how to determine who that is. So, in 2017, there was a pretty comprehensive literature review. It was done in Ireland, so that's why the spelling is a little bit different. As you know, they like to throw in extra vowels in uh, their medical terminology once you go across the pond. Um, and this 2000 lit review is entitled, The Definite Risk and Questionable Benefits of Liberal Pre-Hospital Spinal Mobilization. And this was looking at the old concept of just what can it hurt boarding everybody. And they talked about local uh, edema, swelling to the cord, and hypoxia were far more likely to be contributors to secondary neurological damage. So in other words, you, can, you do have some neurological damage immediately at the point of injury. Uh, that's irrelevant of spinal mobilization. Uh, but if they don't have any then, what, what causes the injury that occurs later? And it's not spinal mobilization, it's swelling and hypoxia and i would also probably throw in their hyperperfusion to the cord which has nothing to do with applying a cervical collar or a board they said that no reliable sources were found proving a benefit and really see reliable sources peer-reviewed evidence uh laboratory studies anything found proven a benefit for mobilization uh but they found a lot of evidence some of which not all of which i uh reviewed uh here uh for that's kind of against pre-hospital mobilization that has lots of discomfort uh, or lots of uh, complications. And we discussed some of those. They even went so far to say, and this was after the consensus guidelines from Nexus and uh, the Canadian spinal rules. Uh, they found that the consensus guidelines um, were supported, but said that maybe they don't go far enough. So the consensus guidelines, which we're going to talk about in a few minutes, were basically criteria to try to minimize uh, the spinal mobilization that was done in the field. They're suggesting that they weren't broad enough. So this 
statement, along with others, um, kind of prompted a in, over here on our side of the pond, the 2018 spinal motion restriction in the trauma patient, a joint position patient or position statement. Excuse me, I'm stuttering a little bit. So this was from them, all the major players over here in the United States uh, to kind of get together because a lot of them had their own separate previous to the separate position papers and they didn't line up. So they developed a uniform standard. And this is from the American College of Surgeons Committee on Trauma. So the guys that do ATLS and, um, you know, set forth trauma uh, center uh, accreditation, stuff like that. The American College of Emergency Physicians, which chances are includes your medical directors. Uh, the National Association of EMS Physicians, which many EMS medical directors, but not all, belong to. So these are the three main parties. Uh, but you could probably uh, get some other groups in there, but these are the big players. Uh, this updated key point uniform guidance is tended for use by EMS personnel and their doctors and physicians and trauma sur surgeons in the healthcare setting. So it's not a different standard for EMS people, a different standard once you go through the door. Granted, doctors do their own thing often, but it's a uniform standard. And here's the key thing. When you see a position paper like this, and uh, if you do something outside the norm, this is one of the things that your, your um, actions will be judged against in a court of law or in a medical review, stuff like that. So it changed. Um, it, one of the big changes is it recommended that changing of use of uh, backboards and such from immobilization devices to extrication devices. And when we talk about extrication, we're not talking about jaws of life type things. We're just talking about removing the patient from their home, from the residence, from their car, uh, from whatever, to the, to the um, ambulance, to the bus, to the MIC, whatever you call it in your local jurisdiction. So extrication is cases used very, very broadly. And then it clarifies that extrication devices may be removed prior to transport by EMS personnel. Um, and it talks about what acceptable methods of spinal motion restriction. Notice they didn't say mobilization during transport include. And they talked about the scoop stretcher vacuum splint, but they also mentioned the ambulance cot or a similar device in which the patient can be safely uh, secured. And this is what we do in our area is uh, we may use a scoop. I very sell, I've used a backboard like once or twice in the past year. Um, use a scoop to get the patient off the ground on the cot, then remove the scoop and the cot becomes our motion restriction device with, with uh, pa proper padding. And they mentioned some revised indications by motion restriction. So with that, you think we'd be getting rid of our backboards. Um, you know, we'd hardly ever use them. They would go in the dumpster, whatever. And actually, that's not the case. Like I said, I have used it a few times. There are some cases where the backboard is superior for extrication compared to a scoop from a car. Probably not the way that this was. This image was uh, would imply. By the way, this image is from uh, I think the first edition of the Orange Book to show you how far we've come in patient care. Uh, the Orange Book is uh, the Emergency Care and Transportation of Sick and Injured. It's one of the earliest uh, paramed or sorry EMT textbooks, but um, it's still out there and they still have value, just a different value than we've had before. So what's our approach now? And honestly, some of you guys are already doing this. So I apologize if this is redundant. Well, first of all, assess the patient. And I really want to stress this. I'll, I'll hammer this down later. Every case of a missed spinal injury or missed cervical spinal injury that we've had, everyone I know about, it's one of its root causes is poor assessment. I want to stress that again. The root cause of every missed um, missed um, spinal injury, or sorry, I should, should say spinal column injury that we've had in my agency and other ones, we've had a few, hasn't been from the protocol. It's that the protocol wasn't followed and the patient wasn't fully assessed. Uh, basically sloppiness. So here are some of the, here's, uh, some of the criteria that in essence, if the patient can ambulate on their own and self-extricate, let them. We'll do more harm and have more movement trying to do standing takedowns that used to be really cool and stuff like that, then we uh, will by letting them just simply sit on the cot. Now, I will qualify this. I have a, I have kind of a, a basketball rule, okay? 
And my basketball rule is kind of like in, in basketball, two or three steps is dribbling. If the patient is t- has to take more than two or three steps to sit down on the cot, that's too far. I don't have these patients that I'm really going to immobilize walk down five flights of stairs. I get them on a stair chair or I get them on the cot, usually within two or three steps. Uh, if the patient is questionable, now, if they if you're wondering, okay, they might be unsteady on their feet, they might actually pass out, so on and so forth, then that's where we use the scoop, LSB, whatever the case is. Those patients um, that you do decide to apply SMR to, apply the cervical collar of choice, not just, and there are other choices besides the rigid cervical collar. Then you will remove the extrication device and secure them to the orthopedic mattress or cot, preferably in the supine position. Um, I will say preferably, but there are some cases we don't want to. Uh, Pickwickian patients, the patients who have really, really obese who can't lay flat, patients who have other respiratory challenges, patients who are severely typhotic who simply do not lay flat. Those you need to make some accommodations for. Is there any time that you would leave the scoop or a long spine board in place? Absolutely. This is not a hard and fast rule. So if I'm doing CPR, if we're doing CPR on a patient, leave it on them. Okay? It's going to make it easier for them to move them and so on and so forth, especially when you have if you have a mechanical device assisting you. If you have other priorities, i.e. airway management, uh, do not worry about removing the scoop and so on and so forth. If you have life threats to deal with okay uh, if you think you're going to have multiple movements uh, of the patient so like say rescue operations where you put them on the scoop and then you're going to carry them up uh, a, a steep scree or something, something like that and then you're going to move them over a jersey barrier and then you're going to do you know this and that you leave you leave them in the uh, extrication device properly secured uh, with whatever safety methods you need uh, until you get them to the uh, final goal, which is on the ambulance cot itself. And the goal is to minimize time on the rigid extrication devices, not to eliminate them, it's to just use them smarter. So who should you be applying spinal motion, selective spinal motion mobilization uh, restriction to? Well, that's where we're getting to here um, because it's not just to you know, I'm not just telling you not to use certain devices. I'm telling you to use them smarter. Um, you need to take what we've talked about and apply it, uh, not just have it pulling around your brain, but actually apply it to action. And again, I have to stress, uh, you got to do your due diligence. you got to have uh, a good assessment skills. You've got to be uh, uh, re- disciplined enough to do those assessment skills at three in the morning, the same you would at three in the afternoon, to do them out in the cold, the same as you would uh, in the comfort of somebody's home. Uh, you, ha- I'm, I'm telling you, you've got to do that because every time we've had a missed injury, it's been because somebody didn't do their due diligence, not because the protocol was wouldn't have picked them up. So please, please, please take that to, to heart. Now, there's several different criteria. Uh, again, your protocol should probably uh, take the best out of all the different criteria. But um, first, we look at the National Association of EMS Physicians. That's the uh, one that we, that's that joint position paper with them and ASAP and the uh, uh, Committee on Trauma Group. And this was their criteria. They talked about for blunt trauma, indications for SMR included altered mental status, midline neck or back pain, and or neurological symptoms. So something you can hang your hat on, a numbness, tingness, tingling, uh, motor weakness. Uh, Look at the dermatomes and see if the pain follows the dermatomes, stuff like that. Any palpable anatomic deformity or swelling to the spine and any distracting injuries. I cannot stress distracting injuries. That's one of the the big ones. Uh, They said there is no role for spinal motion uh, restriction in penetrating trauma. And they said in pediatric trauma, we say if they're under eight, we immobilize them because of uh, concern about uh, spinal cord injury without radiographic abnormality, sclerora. Uh, that's no longer a concern. Uh, that age alone should not be a factor. You need to take in uh, a bunch of uh, criteria. Now, this is a pretty good start, but you notice that there isn't any mention of mechanism of injury, any uh, injury contacts, 
uh, differences for um, the elderly or anything like that. So I, th I, th I think that this was a good consensus statement, but it has some huge gaps in it. So when you look at both uh, the Nexus criteria and the Canadian Spine Rules, which is the, uh, you will notice that um, when they look at when we look at this, the Nexus criteria largely mimics. Uh, the uh, criteria we just looked at, but Canadian Spine Rule also includes mechanism. And I know that we've got some, um, you know, that people joke around about mechanism injury, and I'll talk about that. But here's here's some basic facts, is that compared to Nexus, uh, the Canadian Spine Rule is 99% sensitive. Uh, it's specific. It's uh, uh, almost 10% more specific for spinal injuries particularly. And um, it's results in a reduce, reduction of need for um, CT and x-rays, which means a decreased cost and decreased radio, uh, radiological exposure to the patient. So in all categories, the um, Canadian spinal rules outperform, outperform the Nexus criteria, or the National Association of EMSP criteria that we just mentioned. Well, does that mean we should adopt it straight off the bat? Well, your protocol should, as always, hopefully take the best of both worlds. So what that means is that mechanism injury is kind of back. And I know we joke about it. Um, now, this is uh, actually from my protocol, but I thought it was a great statement. So take with a grain of salt. It said there's insufficient evidence to support absolute criteria for mechanism injury, either as inclusion or exclusion. That said... A prudent pre-hospital provider, so hopefully that's you, should evaluate the role of mechanism of injury and err on the side of mobilization, particularly with the frail, chronically bedridden, or extremes of age. So what we're asking for you, from you guys is clinical judgment, critical thinking, common sense, all wrapped into one. Uh, and I think that's, that's um, not a big ask, but we need to apply these pretty rigorously. So if you look at the Canadian spinal rules that looks at uh, mechanism of injury, uh, it looked at low risk factors. These are patients that don't need uh, necessary spinal mobilization. So these are the patients that were in a simple rear end MVC uh, or they're a fall, but they're in a sitting position. They got up in a sitting position. Uh, when you find them, they're ambulatory anytime after the accident and they have delayed onset of pain. So Delayed means in this context, they say not immediate onset. So the patient that has an impact or traumatic incident and has immediate neck pain, immediate back pain, those you're worried about. Those that have neck pain that slowly comes on 15 minutes later, we're not worried about those as much. We talk about simple rear end MVC. If you read the literature, one of the big ones is it's not pushed. Uh, so you look at an accident and it's got some minor bumper damage. Okay, great. You look at accident, it has some bumper damage, was pushed into it hard enough to push it into a vehicle in front of it. That's not a simple rear end MVC. If you look at the tires and there are skid marks where it was pushed out of its original impact position, that's not a simple rear end MVC. Dangerous mechanisms fall from greater than three feet or five stairs. Okay, this doesn't sound like a lot, but trust me, it is. Uh, an axle low to the head. Something falls on their head, like uh, at a construction site. That's a big one. Uh, certain diving injuries. MVCs at high speed, greater than 62 miles an hour. Your agency may define this differently, but this is the Canadian spinal rules. Uh, I know some agencies define it as greater than 35 miles an hour. Uh, so basically, um, like for example, any roadway where you would be required to put on your yellow safety traffic vest which is by federal, in the United States, by federal law, I believe any um, roadway above 35 miles an hour, maybe getting the actual statute a little bit wrong, those would be uh, considered pot potentially high speed. Rollovers, ejections, end over ends, hit by a large vehicle, we're talking about dump truck or bus, hit hard enough to be pushed, auto pads, auto bikes, and motorized recreational vehicles. So these are your ATVs, your razors. And I guess you could consider your uh, motorcycles in that as well. Uh, the Canadian spinal rule doesn't specifically mention motorcycles that, that I found. I want to make a special comment about diving injuries. 
Uh, there's been a bit of research on this, and actual axle loading injuries and spinal injuries and drowning are exceedingly rare. And the use of motion restrictions, spinal motion restriction, actually delays extrication from the pool, delays life-saving efforts, delays airway management, and increases morbidity. So unless there's a clear indication of injury to the head or spine, and just simply having an injury in a pool is not clear, um, you uh, SMR is not indicated. So what are we talking about clear? We're talking about an actual diving accident where they were seen jumping off the diving board and there, therefore there's a presumption. They were seen falling and hitting their head in the pool, shallow water diving, or some other witnessed event. So somebody who gets tired swimming in a lake in the middle of nowhere, stuff like that, um, those, those aren't indications for spinal motion restriction. Get them out of the water, begin life-saving efforts. I want to talk about another one, and this is really important, uh, the frail, chronically bedridden, or extremes of age. When I mentioned that most of our patients were unable, or most of our missed injuries um, were assessment issues, they also, almost all of them, and actually I may, I may want to back this up and say all of them, but I have to actually go back and think about it. Uh, if there wasn't one that fell, fell into the elderly category, it was really close. Almost all of them were elderly patients who were ground level falls or falls from a wheelchair. So poor assessment combined with age factors was a huge criteria. So please, 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 as Bart Simpson is advising you, have a low threshold of suspicion and put your seat collars properly sized, properly fitted, uh, spinal motion restriction, I should say, not necessarily seat collars, spinal motion restriction on your elderly fall patients. And there's lots of different options out there. We talked about high-speed impacts. Uh, I'm not going to hit this, uh, no pun intended, too hard. But do not discount this. Just because somebody is up and walking around after an accident like this, you really need to consider um, consider the mechanism. Same thing for motorsports. Anything with a high velocity. Uh, Dr. Jonathan Hines said that some of these patients... Uh, that especially in motorsports can be very deceptive. You can have uh, an accident where the bike is destroyed and the patient is relatively unharmed. You can have a case where the bike is relatively unharmed and the patient is absolutely critical in dying. Um, each case is different and you need to evaluate them with a, uh, with a clinician's mind. We already talked about fender benders and auto bicycle accidents. Again, high index of suspicion. You have a large mass to... Um, mass to bot, uh, victim ratio, so I'm a little cautious about that. I'm not going to spend a lot of time on this other than mention that football uh, and other similar high-impact athletic injuries um, present a problem for us. And the problem is that the National Association of Athletic Trainers, Athletic Training Association guidelines were updated in 2015 before our guidelines were changed in 2018, 2019, and they reflect kind of an older... Um, mindset of boarding these patients, uh, a, a more liberal um, case for boarding them. So um, cover this in your guidelines. The, where our doctors have landed, and your doctors may land differently, is that, of course, some things are absolutely appropriate. If the helmet comes off, the pads come off. and the pads come off, the helmet come off, so on and so forth. Using a board uh, to extricate them from the football field is perfectly appropriate also. Um, so on and so forth. However, once you get them on the cot in the ambulance, we're still taking the boards and stuff off. The uh, National Athletic Training Association guidelines actually kind of contradict that, but that's where our physicians and our local community in conjunction with the local athletic trainers have landed. How do you handle this? Well, you solve it before it becomes a problem. You, your medical directors, hopefully, or your education staff, whatever, reach out to your local athletic trainer community and come up with local consensus on how to handle this. Let's talk about gunshot wounds to the head because this is always a point of uh, interesting um, discussion. And the research uh, pretty clearly shows that when you have isolated gunshot wounds to the head originating above the nose, spinal cord injury involvement is exceedingly rare, somewhere between less than... Um, uh, 
somewhere between 0% and 1.4%. Uh, very, very rare. Um, and it also shows that when it's below the nose, it's still uncommon. It's less than 10%. Now that's, so basically uh, above the nose, these are people that shoot themselves in the temple, uh, shoot, get shot in the forehead, stuff like that. Below the nose are the people that stick the gun in their mouth, uh, for example, or get shot in the face. Now with that in mind, you know, some common sense comes into play. But here's the real risk. Uh, now the neck, the actual neck itself is a different animal and the back and thorax are different. So we exclude that them from this discussion. What we do know is that most gunshot wounds that cause spinal cord injury, uh, that it's immediately evident. So you don't have a patient that was shot and is moving all their extremities. Suddenly they stop moving their extremities because of an unrecognized injury. Uh, if they stop moving their extremities it's because their blood pressure is dropping, they're in trouble. These gunshot victims die from head injury, hypoxia, hypotension, and airway failure. Uh, they require immediate airway control in many cases, which spinal motion restriction can um, can complicate. So it's clinically beneficial. Maybe if you absolutely have to mobilize these patients, wait until you get the tube or get the airway managed until you uh, until you do so. Uh, but the research pre shows that shows especially for the um, gunshot wounds above the nose that the risk of cord injury is pretty rare. Again, follow your local protocols. Um, now we look at, now I want to clarify that gunshot wounds to the spine do account for about 13 to 17% of spinal cord injuries, but those are particularly in the neck and the back. People who are shot explicitly along their spine or who are shot specific, spe specifically in the trunk. This is different than those with isolated, isolated gunshot wounds to the head. Pay attention to LOC, and I mentioned this before, but uh, we're, we're, what I'm talking about here is the intoxicated patients, and especially patients with dementia, the elderly patient with a ground level fall. And I keep coming back to this, the elderly patient with a ground level fall, because I cannot stress enough how often the same theme keeps coming up in chart reviews, okay? Now, altered LOC is anybody with a GCS less than 14. Uh, and that includes dementia patients. Uh, that includes the grossly intoxicated, so on and so forth. So you combine this altered mental status with elderly and frail victims, and it's a double whammy. It's a double whammy. You have the elderly patient in the memory care unit that falls out of their wheelchair and they have osteoporosis. Boom, it's a recipe for problems. So you should really have a high index of suspicion for these victims. Um, and trying to make sure that uh, they get properly. Um, again, we got to be careful to see collar, but uh, get proper spinal motion restriction on a cot, not on a board, etc. Now, I briefly, want to talk about distracting injuries, and it's very difficult to define distracting injuries because any injury may be uh, considered distracting in the right context uh, and depend on the patient's response. But I will say that any moderate injury to the upper extremity, shoulder, clavicle, lateral neck. And this is from our local experience here in my community and my agency. We found that, um, that we did have in the early days some missed um, spinal column injuries because of distracting pain that seemed to mask the more subtle pain. And that was usually humeral fractures, uh, sh clavicle fractures. Um, lateralized, you know, whatever it might be. Facial injuries, uh, suspicious for fractures, so they get a baseball bat to the face. Well, that's definitely going to be distracting. And really, any injury, if it's bad enough to require analgesia, can be considered distracting. You need to look at the mechanism of injury. So if somebody rolls their ankle and you're given some pain management for a flipped ankle, probably not. If they broke their ankle because they fell off the roof, absolutely. So keep that in mind that it, even if it's just a flesh wound, if it's, it can also be distracting. So finally, as we wrap up, are there any innovative solutions in spinal motion restriction that may make, that may help us address the concerns about this, uh, increasing injury rates, pain, so on and so forth, all the stuff we talked about. 
And across the pond in Australia, New Zealand, and also I believe in the UK, they're moving this way. Uh, they're using foam collars and they're moving using these quite a lot. And the one on the left here is from New Zealand. The one on the right is from the Queensland Am Ambulance Service. And you notice that they have these stickers on them to say, hey, just because this patient's on doesn't mean they've been examined uh, by a physician. Uh, that was to address some local concerns. Um, each agency, you see they're taking different approaches, but they've moved almost completely away from rigid C collars to these soft C collars. Keep in mind, here's the thing. These will not immobilize the neck the way that we are familiar with rigid C collars, which is a good thing. Because if we had soft C collars that were as rigid and as tight and as restrictive as hard C collars, you'd have all the same risk factors. These are really just to encourage the patient to keep their head in a neutral inline position with minimal motion. Okay. So you need to understand that your expectations have to change with this. Here in the U.S., some agencies are going to foam collars. Uh, in my agency, we went to these with mixed results. Some people like them, some people don't. These are one size fit all vacuum collars, like your vacuum splints. Um, and they're, I like them. I think they're really good for kyphotic patients. They're really good when you apply them correctly, but it's not as simple as just slapping them on and sucking the air out. Um, you, uh, you really got to practice with these a little bit, uh, practice with patients and in different anatomical positions, so on and so forth. But again, if your expectation is that these will be as tight and as rigid as uh, rigid C collars, you're going to be disappointed. These are really, think of them more like soft foam collars just as to help the patient keep their anatomical, uh, their own specific anatomical position. So with that in mind, I hope this has been useful. I hope it's uh, opened your eyes a little bit to some of the hazards and concerns about rigid C collars. If you still have to use them, um, that that's your agency's choice. So I'm not going to point fingers and laugh. But uh, hopefully, if you are still using rigid C collars, you're using them smarter. And maybe now you have enough information to start pursuing some different alternatives. With that in mind, I hope you guys are staying safe out there. And we'll see you out there. Thank you.